agenda for today. We're going to look at SIP, the Carbon Inventory Project, introducing you to it today. We're going to talk about Energy Star Portfolio Manager and an introduction to benchmarking, which is totally Misha's territory. And then um, if we can resolve some technical difficulties, we'll be talking about what museums can learn from benchmarking from Robert Lamb. Then we'll have some time for questions and answers and talk, talking about especially your next steps. So I'm going to start us off by telling you about Culture Over Carbon, which is an existing project that has created the one we're talking about today. So this project fills a data gap between, you know, what the rest of the rest of the sectors understand about their carbon emissions and what the museum sector needs to learn about carbon emissions. So the Institute for Museum and Library Services is funded a project uh, run by New Buildings Institute, which Misha is representing today, um, led by New England Museum Association and Environment and Culture Partners, where we're analyzing energy use of 230 buildings at 130, 133 different institutions. We're looking for patterns in energy use, whether you're a zoo, museum, garden, or historic site. Looking to see if we can create sector-wide benchmarks that can help institutions compare their energy use to the average for the sector. Our goal is that everyone in the museum field will participate, but for the research for the Culture Over Carbon Project, we've created our group and we're finishing up that work. But those of you who are not part of Culture Over Carbon can participate in what came out of that project. And that's the Carbon Inventory Project. We realized that museums were struggling to find their energy data, make a point of recording and capturing it, and then feel comfortable sharing it with others and feel that they had some sort of context that other people were doing this work and that it was important. It wasn't just a sort of a desk chore that they might fit into their day. So we created Carbon Inventory Project as an outgrowth of that IMLS project funded with um, money from that grant in order to build up the proportion of museums in the sector that are counting their energy carbon footprints and then sharing that data every year. Our goal is to raise awareness of the cultural sector's carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions associated with energy use. Now you can do this research as well for your travel and for all your materials and for waste, but for this project, we're focusing on um, emissions from energy use. And we realized during Culture Over Carbon that a little bit more support and structure and time in order to gather monthly energy data and then collate it and interpret it would make a big difference. So we've created the Carbon Inventory Project with end-to-end -end support from now through next May until we all report in June, creating a cohort of museums who are all doing this together, showing up as you are able to our sessions for office hours or presentations like this to feel part of the team that's doing this work. We're going, we've established Carbon Day, which takes place on June 16th of every year, so that all of you who are participating will have collected your energy data from calendar year 2022, so, um, collect it all and share it with us by the 1st of June so that we can aggregate it and create a number for the sector on June 16th. Our goal, potential goal, is that we'll have enough museums participating using Energy Star Portfolio Manager that the EPA has enough data of the right kind to create a benchmark for museums. Right now, most of the other sectors have benchmarks, but we can only compare ourselves to other types of buildings and operations. We can't compare ourselves to other museums. That's what we'd like to be able to do so that we know how we can improve our work. So there are a few challenges and opportunities, but if we do this work together, we support each other and keep each other on task and then share our information, we can hold ourselves accountable for emissions. Each of you can consider setting footprint reduction goals. You can recognize and celebrate all of your achievements. And for gosh sakes, we can point out how much funding we need in order to reduce those numbers. 
so that when we set our goals and align them with the nation's goals for how much we're going to reduce carbon, we've got a scientific background, a database background for setting those goals, and we've got funding in order to achieve those goals. It's our job to help get you to that finish line. So through presentations like today and our office hours, we believe we can all get this done together. So this is a run through of the dates. Don't panic. You'll get another copy of this. You'll see this again at the very end of the presentation. We're recording the presentation and we're making the dates available online where you'll be able to sign up just like you have today. All right, I'm gonna take a breath and I'm gonna pass it over to Misha. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so I'm Misha Egoff. I'm a technical associate at New Buildings Institute and I helped out with the uh, information gathering and analysis for the Culture Over Carbon project. Uh, and I will also be helping to support this uh, new endeavor, the Carbon Inventory Project. So I uh, just wanted to give a little bit of context about where we've been. Um, we're really excited about the participation that we saw in Culture Over Carbon. And I recognize a few names in this group, uh, folks that I've communicated with. Um, so we segmented the participation into nine cultural institution types. And you can see here, uh, we had the highest representation from art museums, followed by historic houses. And this is in terms of the number of buildings submitted. Um, Sarah, can you click one more time and I'll show a map? So yeah, also just wanted to show that we did get participation across the US, um, but there was a large representation in the Eastern Seaboard. Um, so then Sarah, I think you can advance to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so using the data that we got from those institutions, um, we were able to uh, conduct some of this uh, sector level analysis. And so we calculated the site energy use intensity, which is the blue bars here, um, which is in units of KBTU per square foot per year, and the carbon intensity, which is the green bars here, um, for each cultural institution type. And so uh, you can see here that art museums had the highest uh, energy use intensity or EUI, um, but zoos and aquariums had the highest carbon intensity. This is all relative because as you can see, um, everyone's grouped pretty closely. Um, but just wanted to show a little bit, uh, this is just kind of a sneak peek. We're gonna be publishing a final report early next year that'll provide more of these kind of insights. But um, with the participation that you know Sarah was describing, we were able to get this kind of preliminary look at where the industry stands. Okay, so now that you have a little bit more background information, I wanna talk a little bit about um, reaching this goal that Sarah was talking about. And one of the, the key things, uh, key pieces to that puzzle is the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Um, so just gonna give a brief introduction now. We do have another webinar coming up where we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, but for those that are not familiar, um, it's a free tool and you can use it to assess and track your energy and water consumption, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, your costs over time, and you basically provide simple, a simple set of inputs and it translates that into performance metrics like energy use intensity, emissions intensity, and in, uh, it can include some financial metrics as well. Um, it's especially helpful for owners with portfolios um, like campuses uh, where you have a lot of buildings because it's one central platform where you can track all of your buildings in one portfolio. Um, but even if you only have one building, it does provide that kind of streamlined reporting uh, and then helping us work towards that kind of more sector-wide um, benchmarking. So one of the, the offerings that Energy has is this Ener Energy Star has is this Energy Star building score. And so for a lot of institution types, uh, you can input your data into Portfolio Manager and then you get this one to 100 Energy Star score, which is basically um, comparing your performance to similar buildings nationwide, and that's normalized for weather and operating characteristics. A score of 50 is the median and higher is better. So as Sarah mentioned, there's no Energy Star building score for museums. 
Um, it requires to create that score for a certain building type, you need to have a nationally representative data set of um, buildings that have provided at least 12 months of whole building energy data. And you need to have a diverse set of buildings that are showing the different physical and operational characteristics within that building type. So this, this graphic here to the right shows some of the buildings that do have that score option. And as, as Sarah mentioned, um, because we don't have that for museums or really any sort of benchmarking um, at that level, uh, we have to kind of find the closest comparison, the closest building type to compare to. And so, yeah, we want to change that. Uh, so the more institutions that cultural institutions that provide data through Energy Star Portfolio Manager, um, that means that we'll be getting closer to that goal of being able to have a more of an industry uh, benchmark. Um, some of the other, uh, oh, <laughs> some of our other uh, calls coming up will have office hours to answer kind of specific questions. Um, and like I said, on December 15th, we'll go into more detail. Um, I did also just provide a link here. There's a kind of quick start guide. So if you're really excited after this call and you want to learn more, um, you can go ahead and check that out and get started. So I've been talking a lot about benchmarking, and I think it would be good to take a step back and talk about what that actually means for those of you who might not be familiar. Uh, so I'm going to give just a high level overview. So benchmarking just means that you're measuring and comparing your building energy use um, to something, and that something could either be uh, baseline performance of that building, so your past performance of that building, other buildings in the same portfolio, again, thinking about campuses where you've got multiple buildings that you're managing, uh, peer buildings, so other art museums maybe uh, in your area, um, or a reference performance level. Uh, so any building can be benchmarked. Uh, it's just a matter of gathering that data and figuring out what you're comparing to. So why would you take the time to do this? Well, there's a lot of benefits to benchmarking. Um, first of all, you can improve your understanding of energy consumption patterns and drivers. Um, just to chart everything out, you can see at the top right here, um, this is from Portfolio Manager. If you start tracking this, um, you get this kind of detailed dashboard about how you're really doing. Um, for multi-building campuses, uh, you can figure out which buildings are the most efficient, which then in turn means you can identify the buildings that are most in need of energy efficiency upgrades um, and try to pinpoint the most effective performance improvements. So you, you can see, okay, it looks like my use in the winter is really high, so maybe I need to focus on heating, or my use in the summer is really high, so I need to focus on cooling. Um, and then also, as you start implementing those improvements, um, you can actually track your energy savings. So you can see the graphic in the lower right. Um, this is also from Portfolio Manager showing kind of the baseline of one of the buildings and then where they're at um, and, and seeing that improvement to the far right. So in addition to those kind of general planning and, and process improvement benefits, um, there is actual value <laughs> to benchmarking your buildings. Uh, so Energy Star did a study and found that um, the buildings that had been benchmarked over a three-year period through Portfolio Manager showed an average energy savings, of, annual energy savings of 2.4%. And so that means you're using less energy, which means you're saving money, and it's providing more funds that you can use for your core activities instead of just giving it to the utility company, right? Um, so. Over to the right here, this is an excerpt from the study that they did um, just to try to show that with that financial savings that you realize, um, that can be very impactful um, depending on the size of your building and your consumption. So also just looking beyond kind of the, the actual um, financial savings that you can realize through doing this and energy savings, um, they there was another study that was done that showed that actually this is uh, I believe for San Francisco um, they have a mandatory benchmarking requirement for buildings over a certain size and they saw that over the the period um, a several year period where they were requiring this benchmarking that this sector actually reduced did reduce their greenhouse gas emissions which 
makes sense because you're using less energy, right? Um, just simply measuring and gaining awareness of your, your energy use does lead to this kind of modest reduction in energy use, just, just having that awareness. And then in turn, that means you're decreasing your greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's helping the entire industry and you know the whole climate move forward uh, to try to reach greenhouse re gas reduction goals. And of course, um, participating in this and providing this data and helping get towards a benchmark um, does also help provide more visibility and representation for um, the entire cultural institution sector. So I want to just kind of go back to the portfolio manager uh, summary where we started and just give you a little bit more information about what is actually needed. Uh, again, we'll go into a little more detail in December, but for those of you who are excited to get started, um, all you need is basically four things. So you need a free portfolio manager account. Uh, you need some basic data about your building characteristics. So like when it was built, uh, gross square feet, things like that. Um, you also need at least 12 months of energy data. More is obviously better, but we recognize that it can be a challenge even to just get one year of data sometimes. Um, and this does include delivered fuels. So if you have like propane or fuel oil, it would include that and any on-site generation. So if you have on-site solar or wind, uh, you would want to include that as well. And uh, if you have a building where you have part of the building is say a natural history museum and the other part is a science and technology museum or art museum, or you have a cafe, um, you also want to try to um, kind of outline your allocation of those uh, different uses within the building. Um, portfolio manager does have a way to say, you know, 20% of the building is actually a restaurant or, or things like that. So you can provide that segmentation. Um, so again, I've linked the guide if you're excited to get started, but otherwise definitely encourage everyone to attend the upcoming office hours and we'll be able to answer kind of some specific questions at that point. Oh, Sarah, we can't hear you. Who can't hear you yet? Stephanie, are there any questions at this point while we're waiting for Sarah? To... Sorry, there are not. Okay. There you oh, go. Looks like you're back, Sarah. I'm back and Robert's with us. So I'm ready to. Quick check. Can you hear me? I had a lot of technical problems this morning. Yeah. We're sorry okay. about that. Sorry about Good. that. We're glad yeah, you no. stuck with it. Yeah, as well. So, um, so hello, all. I'm just going to chat a little bit about what uh, you might be able to learn from benchmarking. For those of you that haven't participated in such a program before, uh, we'll do a quick little overview of one that we've been doing for the International Association of Museum Facility Administrators. So we can just jump to the next uh, slide. So we've been doing this program uh, for about 20 some years now. It was actually started by the Canadian Museum of Civilization and uh, it's been evolving over time. But uh, consistently, we've had at least 30 of the leading museums in the U.S. Uh, participate across the entire time spectrum, and a lot of other organizations have kind of participated in different years and at different times. Uh, we'll go to the next one. So the benchmarking process, so you got this uh, graphic I used to show the six main steps of benchmarking. You can see uh, other people talk about maybe the, the number of steps a little bit different, but uh, we've organized it like this because we believe that no matter where you are in your development, you should be getting value out of each of the steps of the process. And you can see the link at the bottom. You're welcome to go get a white paper that talks about the entire process and every step and what you should be doing. But our program for IAMFPA is structured so that um, all the people that participate in that, all the organizations, they either want to do one of a couple things. They either want to document what their baseline is because of them, some of them do need to report their their status and their progress to their funding agencies or government entity or some other organization uh, that talks about all their performance. Uh, obviously, they all want to get better, and then many times they want to use it to track their progress as they're doing that. And then we've structured the data collection to be able to deal with both to facilitate the collection and comparison of metrics and the actual data itself, 
as well as discussion about the best practices and to share the lessons learned, because that's really the biggest value that you get from participating in the program is you get to see how you stand, but then you also see how somebody that's doing better, what do they do? What did they do that you can do? Uh, it's your organization or your facility. And then the, the result of that is every participant uses the results based on their objectives. And as you're all aware, some years you might be very focused on having them to maintain uh, the, the value of the, uh, the facility or the, the environment that you have. Other years, there may be more focus on we have to manage our costs this year because of particular challenges we're facing. And increasingly, we're all looking at our footprint uh, for the environment and for the greenhouse gases this whole program is talking about. Okay, the next uh, slide. What we do in our programs, we actually take a full view. It's not narrowly focused on energy. It's across the entire spectrum of uh, performance metrics for, for the property, for the facilities, uh, having to do with the asset quality and the space metrics, uh, looking at the operating cost metrics and even the capital cost metrics, uh, looking at sustainability metrics, which are include energy, greenhouse gas, waste, and water, and then some organizational metrics. Uh, how's the capital? What's the capital program uh, like? What's your level of your occupant service and staffing levels? Uh, and then some some of the metrics like greenhouse gas, there's an organization component. It's not key to property, but it's part of, say, the, the operations, which include your vehicles and equipment that you're using to as part of your property operations, maybe. So, so what we started with all along, energy cost has been of interest to this group since the very start. It's a significant uh, percentage of the direct O&M cost. Um, and it's driven by, uh, largely for the art world anyway, driven by the set points that are required uh, that the curatorial staff wants to have so that they can do shared collections and uh, based on their best practices of what they believe for the, the actual collections themselves. And you can see the chart in the bottom shows uh, temperatures in uh, set points in Fahrenheit and then also the relative humidity set points. And you can see there's some variation in this group because this, I did not filter this down to just art uh, organizations, but include some science and technology and, and other types of organizations. So we do the metrics to show where they stand by quartile, what the median is, and that identifies whether they have, where they actually have opportunities for improvement and how their performance is on any particular metric. Now, what has happened in the next slide is we've become, if you can go back one, yeah. Uh, we've become much more interested in recent years on the practices and technology. So we actually benchmark these and have put them on a scale of a five point scale of of it's a consistent and everyday part of our operation to, well, we don't use it at all. Right. So in between, there's a lot of, of variations on sometimes we do it. We're not consistent. We'd like to do it. We're just exploring it. And we use that chart that showed the bar chart in the top left there. Uh, to, for people to look at things to say, look, I want to get better on this particular metric, uh, say utility management or energy cost. And if I need to do something that's quick and easy, I'm going to work off the left side of this chart, which are things that are more the tried and true kind of things that people are doing. And if I need to want to make a radical improvement and really jump out ahead of the group, I'm going to be looking at the things that are on the right side of the chart, which are things that people are only starting to use in the industry. And maybe I'll learn some lessons along the way. So the, the benefit of the benchmarking is everybody is somewhere out different on this chart and they can all share where they did. So as a group, everybody kind of moves forward quicker. We've also become much more interested in not just the energy costs, but the usage rates and the nature of the energy composition that we're, we're using. And this chart here on the right shows actually, it's, it's a year um, data through a year ago. Um, shows that uh, the power sources in the cultural institutions in our group, it's about half electric, but the other half of it is some component of fossil fuels. And so that's really become the challenge that we see for the CO2 reduction. And many of these are going to be difficult challenges because uh, a lot of our, our institutions are in, in urban settings and we're on a, a municipal steam district or something like that where we don't really kind of maybe control what the source of the energy is for those and it's not, there's not a very easy um, alternative for those kind of struct organizations. And the next slide I think is, <clears throat> yeah. So the benefits, why would you wanna be in a bench market program? So the benefits for our folks, number one, they get to document their performance. Now you may be doing that already, 
Uh, but this is because you're actually collecting your data. And as uh, was noted earlier in the presentation here, that there is uh, some effort and challenge in that. And we do uh, want to help you coach you along with ways to do that that don't take um, any more effort than is needed. The second benefit is a context of your performance versus others like you. And this is going to be relative to your objectives. On some criteria, you need to demonstrate you're a leader, or you may want to demonstrate that. And that's kind of bragging rights, if you will, or, or illustrations to your greater community that, that these things can be done. Sometimes it's in some aspects of it, you just want to demonstrate you're competitive, that you're being responsible, and that you're, um, you're kind of in step with the industry. And then the third item is the one that is, as noted earlier on the benchmarking, is this is something that helps you identify where you have some improvement opportunities. So you really know where you need to start paying attention uh, to try to change your performance and, and move and become better at it. And then the third benefit that because most of our particip participants are kind of leading industry um, institutions, they feel uh, an obligation they want to help the entire state of the industry improve. So from the group's participation. So a lot of that is to identify what are the standard practices that we're doing? What are the leading practices that we are doing or should be doing? And can we adopt these and, and use these and talk about them as share them amongst the group to raise performance across the industry? Because we'll all learn lessons learned about how we got there, even if it's a great practice. Uh, sometimes there's some real learning curve in how do we employ this practice at our organization. So those are the real benefits that, that we see and we hear about on a regular basis from people that participate in our benchmarking program and ones that I think you would expect as well. And with that, I think um, kind of gave a recap there and we'll turn it back to Sarah. Okay. Thank you very much, Robert. I'm so appreciative that you persevered and were able to join us. So you all of you have heard um, quite a different scale from very simple Energy Star Portfolio Manager to more complex work that is being done by Robert's group. Um, very few of us went to school, had any training on energy management or recording this kind of data. So we're all at different places in our knowledge and our understanding of this work but none of us can ignore it. It's now a critical issue that everyone at a museum has a responsibility in, and someone has to take the responsibility of knowing what that number is and helping the rest of the staff work to reduce it. What we're hoping is that you'll find a way through this STIP, the Carbon Inventory Project, to slot into the learning groups, to come to our presentations, to come to office hours and talk with others and talk with us and build your own path towards collect, creating a habit of collecting that information and then sharing it as a, a total number anonymously to the world, but a total number to create to the goals, um, to, to add to the aggregate impacts of the cultural sector and then create your own goal for reducing it and work towards it. The reason that's so important is that the entire nation, the entire globe is working on this. And it requires all of society to participate, including cultural institutions. We don't get a pass because we're nonprofits. We don't get a pass because we feel poor. All of us have a stake in reducing these impacts. And over a year ago, when President Biden put the United States back in the Paris Agreement, he used this text in the White House press release. This text came from the work that all of the sectors do through organizations like America is All In, where we come together and we say what we're committed to. We, act, we put our resources together, we team up, and we reduce our impacts. Cultural institutions institutions were part of creating this text. Now it's time for us to step up and help the government get to that 50, 52% reduction by 2030. You've probably heard, and you're about to hear more on the run up to the um, Council of the Parties, COP27, the UN Conference on Climate Change, that we're missing our mark, that we're not doing as much as we need to. Let me temper that by saying we're doing a lot more than anyone expected, but we still have a long way to go. And we need to be part of that participation. So I'm hoping that you'll take this opportunity to join us and start doing this work. 
You and all of your museum friends can join this project at any point. If you miss today, that doesn't matter. So there's a this is being recorded. Those of you who are listening and are joining the project later, now on December 15th, next February, or at the beginning of May, when you sit down and calculate all of your energy bills from 2022, it's all good enough. We want to get those annual totals by January 1st. So we hope that you'll, if you don't already know, you'll find out who gets the energy bills and the building information at your place, whether it's your parent organization or it's somebody at your museum or, or it becomes you. That you'll create a protocol for gathering that information monthly, whether you put a reminder on your calendar, um, you ask somebody to nudge you regularly, or you put these dates on your calendar and do the work in the half hour just before you join us for office hours. We hope you'll create a regular sequence of responsibilities, little clips of time that will make it so much easier to calculate that data. You'll join us, you'll ask us questions, you'll test drive the system, and we'll all get through it together. And by the time we're done, you'll be an expert at this. And next year's work will be so much easier that you'll be bringing your friends and colleagues and being part of our presentation coaches for SIP, the Carbon Inventory Project next year. So this is the schedule. You'll find it at the ECP website. You see the link there and that we hope that you'll join us. With that, I'll stop sharing and invite some questions. I guess one thing I'll add uh, while we're waiting for any questions is that, um, yeah, Sarah, I think that you really hit it on the head in terms of building in that those little bits of time to keep up with the monthly data. I think the biggest push really is gathering that first year of data, going back through the records and finding that historical information. But once you have that, um, it shouldn't be a lot of time to to just spend that little bit of time every month and, and update those numbers. And Portfolio Manager helps with that as well. You know, it's a very easy input. There's a few different options in terms of that data entry. So we can talk more about that in December too. And one thought about establishing a new behavior, um, this is called conservation behaviors. These are behaviors that allow you to take conservation actions. And sometimes it can be as simple as saying to yourself, you know, it, the day that I do my enter my data into um, Energy Star Portfolio Manager, as soon as I get it done, I get an extra fancy coffee <laughs> or I get that cupcake or I get to take a walk. I'm all all for bribery or at least consider it a reward for doing good work. Give that to yourself for having done this um, and you'll find that it's a little bit easier to work it into your day and eventually you won't even need to have the reward. It'll just be something you feel good about doing and are glad to be able to accomplish and contribute. Did I see that there was a question or? Yes, we just got a question from Corey. So a deadline by which you're aiming to get art museums committed to this benchmarking. Um, anyone can commit at any time. We would love to hear from you as soon as you commit to doing this work. We're aggregating everybody's information by June 1st of next year. So it's the uh, calendar year of 2022. If you have your data completed before then, we will take it because we don't want to crush on the first, but we're setting a target date of that. Anybody in the audience have something to contribute about similar work going on or their experiences with doing benchmarking? Want to tell us about it so that others hear and are encouraged? Yes, I, I'll <laughs> Jump in, Sarah. This is uh, Tatiana Dalsama from National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, 
and just wanted to to encourage both of you about how important um, this benchmarking project is and um, how great it is that that IMLS is supporting this work. Um, and just wanted to to briefly share for everyone on the webinar that um, if as you're going along your benchmarking process and you're trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to take this data and use it to affect change in our organization and get um, our board involved and our volunteers and our community. Um, National Endowment for the Humanities just launched a grant program that would <laughs> support um, that type of strategic planning that would lead to a climate action plan. Um, so taking this benchmarking data and then turning it into a plan, a strategic plan that your organization can use. Um, and so I'm just going to drop the link in the chat to that program. Um, I am planning on joining um, all of the CIP meetings. Um, so, you know, if there are questions, I'll put my email address um, in the, the chat as well. Um, but just wanted to throw that out for any museums. It, they do need to be humanities focused organizations. So um, definitely art museums, history museums, historic houses, maybe subsets of botanic gardens or zoos if they're looking at archives in particular or something that you know can slot in with the humanities but um you know great great work and definitely just second everything that um everyone said today about the importance of of getting the sector um, and getting the the benchmarking done so thank you thank you and uh, we're we're thrilled with that project it i can't remember if she said that there's a january 7th 17th deadline. Um, in my former life, I was a grant proposal writer. So with that hat on, I would encourage you if you're applying for that grant program, that if you're participating in the carbon inventory project, that you say that in the grant application that says that you're already working on this and um, cognizant of the importance of doing the benchmarking work. And that you'll have that benchmarking, you know, by the time grants are awarded. So you can start working from there. Tatiana, you'll say if I overstepped there, but it's my recommendation. No, that's good, good advice. Anyone else questions or comments? Tips to add if you already do this work yourself? All right, we'll we'll lurk a little longer, but you're welcome to quietly slip off if you'd like to. Yep, I can put those dates back up on the screen if you. Thank you all so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you at other office hours and having your contributions. Thanks, Corey. Sarah, do we know how many or mission institutions already use Energy Star? Because there's not. Oh, Sarah, I see you're trying to talk, <laughs> but you're on mute. Uh, I don't know that there's an. A known number. I think part of the issue is that there is not the museum's, you know, category in portfolio manager in the way that, you know, there isn't the benchmarking there. So I'm not sure that there's an easy way to pull that information. 
Um, we could probably pull the number that participated uh, for the Culture Over Carbon project, if you give me one minute. Yeah, the, one of the reasons I'm asking, I'm all on an audio, right? Is um, I do know that, you know, there's, I think 17 cities require benchmarking, Energy Star benchmarking for for facilities above certain size. Many of the museums will will fall into that range. So they have to be putting it in somehow. And then there's also, what, six or eight, uh, 20, 30 districts that, and they report having a fairly substantial cultural institution makeup. Uh, I'm just curious what categories they're putting it under um, to see if we could try to draw at some of that data for this project. Yeah, I think that there is technically actually a, when you are uploading the data, you can select the museum type. It's just that there's not any ah. kind of standardized reporting on that. So I'm just looking now at the participants from the Culture Over Carbon project, and it looks like people self-identified uh, for a lot of different building types, I see library, I see mixed use property, I see other entertainment slash public assembly, other dash education, uh, a couple offices, and then there are a couple that identified as museum. So even within the buildings that we know are museums that are in Portfolio Manager right now, if you were to just do a search of museums, you may not actually catch them all just based on that. Yeah, that's I think that's part of this this project too. Sorry, this is Stephanie from ECP to make you know to have people to select the the same categories, and we're working with Energy Star as well, um, trying to make a connection to them to see you know how many we would need to even create that category. And I can also just fill in and say that for the Culture Over Carbon project, um, we it looks like we pulled data from seventy five properties. Uh, and so that would be distinct buildings. So like, you know, there's certain, um, like a botanical garden might have multiple buildings. Um, so that, that's not 75 institutions, that's 75 buildings that we receive data through Portfolio Manager. And we know that the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative has, um, requires all participants to use Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And some of them overlap with this, but not all. Um, and then Robert's group as well. So we're getting closer, but we need a broader pool. Yeah, sadly, not all of my group does the Energy Star. Most mm -hmm. of them do. Most of them do, but not all of them. Yeah. Well, you can encourage them to join us. I <laughs> well, I have, and I will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the office hours, we'll I'll jump on as much as I can, but we'll explore that. Obviously, the challenge for many of them is the staff resources to yeah. to deal with it. So that, hence why our, our interest in automating as much of that as we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 